Good afternoon. I'm sure everybody was at least once in his own life stirred, troubled by a dream. Because in dreams happen things which you never imagine could happen. And they come from our experience, but an experience which is far beyond our reach. It happened to me several times in my life. And it, it gave me new revelations of music and even of technical problems. It happened always with music by Chopin. I was impressed and stirred, I would say, by music by Chopin since my childhood. And I'm still, when I play Chopin, like in a kind of dream. I will allow myself to tell you a little story, rather two, if I have the time, which happened with an etude by Chopin. Everybody who plays the piano knows how difficult uh, Chopin is from the virtuosity point of view, because still Chopin remains the highest expression of the virtuosity, of pianistic virtuosity from the point of view of the variation of the sound, of the touché, touch, of the inspiration, of the improvisation, because you have to render the genius of Chopin and not just the notes of Chopin. Because he describes all the human moods possible in connection with the, the whole world actually around, and all this stirs something inside oneself, and gives personal feelings. It once happened that I was troubled by the etude in double thirds. It's a well-known piece because every pianist tries to play it. Some uh, can play it, some others try it for a whole life and don't achieve it. Some pianists practice it for seven years, some other for seven months, some others for more or less. It happened that I was troubled with a problem. One night I had a dream that the great Rubinstein, Arthur Rubinstein, came to me at home and I asked him, how does he play that? And he took my hand, put it on the piano, and said, look, like that. Of course, in the morning, I was very keen to know what exactly he showed me, but of course, I couldn't discover. Then I went and I practiced. I practiced for a tour. I practiced the Tchaikovsky concerto, which I played... Uh, I don't know, more than 150 times and so on. And at the end of the two hours of practice, I tried to play this etude. And all of a sudden, the nasty passage was going absolutely perfect. What I was doing was another fingering. And that was all worked in the subconscious. For whoever plays the piano knows how difficult it is to change the fingering which you use for many years. That was one instance when the subconscious worked for solving a technical problem. Another time, being quite ill, I had the feeling of death. <laughs> and through a dream, I was revealed on how the first movement of the so-called funeral march sonata should be played. Now, since then, whenever I played, I have the same feeling, and I played in quite a different way than I would have ever played it if I wouldn't have had this dream kind of revelation. I will try to convey to you today, in three etudes, some of the moods of the expressions of Chopin's genius. The first one is the black key etude, 
which is sparkling, champagne-like, joyful, playful, capricious, witty, subtle, and a little bit passionate, bubbling with passion and expectation, in a word, perfectly satisfied mood. The next one, the most contrasting one, is desolated, evocative, speaking right from the heart of the lost past, from far away, from the innermost profound regret, sometimes with resignation, with undertones of despair. Then at a certain moment, he gives us the feeling that he is restoring, maybe, life as it used to be, giving the impression of being carried away by an illusion of warmth, tenderness, and purity, and thereafter entranced by the poignant pursuit of the ideal image. The peak of the drama is the moment of renouncement when tired and discouraged one returns to disappointing reality, extinguishing little by little all hope until any light of the hallucination is dissipated into the misty nowhere. It ends in a kind of transfiguration. The last one is noble, full of pride, full of protest, it's tragic, and rebellious, and it tends to bring a hope and victory.